Most adults convicted of the kinds of crime in which T Trina, Ian, and Antonia were charged are right? most adults. Most adults convicted of the kinds of crimes which, with which Trina, Ian, and Antonio were charged are not sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. In the federal system, adults who unintentionally commit arson, murder, were more than one or where more than one person is killed usually receive sentences that permits release in less than 25 years. Many adults convicted of attempted murder in Florida serve less than 10 years in prison. Gun violence with no reported injuries frequently result in sentences of less than 10 years for adult defendants, even in this era of harsh punishment. Children who commit serious crimes long have been vulnerable to adult prosecution and punishment in many states, but the development of the juvenile justice system has meant that most child offenders were sent to juvenile detention, facil uh, detention facilities. Juvenile justice, juvenile justice systems vary across the United States, but most states would have kept Trina, Ian, or Antonio in juvenile custody until they turned 18 or 21. At most, they might have stayed in custody until they're age 25 or older, if the institutional history or juvenile detention record suggests that they were still a threat to public safety. In an early era, if you were 13 or 14 when you committed a crime, you would find yourself in an adult system with a lengthy sentence. Only if the crime was unusually high profile or committed by a black child against a white person in the South. For instance, in the infamous Scottsboro boy case in 1930s, two of the defendants, Roy White and Eugene Williams, were just 13 years old when they were wrongfully convicted of rape and sentenced to death in Alabama. In another signature case of juvenile prosecution, George Stinney, S-T-I-N-N-E-Y, Stinney, a 14-year-old black boy was executed by the state of South Carolina on June 16, 1944. Three months earlier, two young white girls who lived nearby in Akalu, Alkalu, Alkalu, who lived nearby in Alkalu, a small mill town where the races were separated by railroad tracks, had gone out to pick flowers and never returned home. Scores of people across the community went searching for the missing girl. Young George and his siblings joined the search party. At some point, George mentioned to one of the white adult searchers that he and his sister had seen the girls earlier in the day. The girls had approached them while they were playing outside and asked where they could find flowers. The next day, the dead bodies of the girls were found in a shallow ditch. George was immediately arrested for the murders because he, he was immediately arrested for the murders because he had admitted seeing the girls before they disappeared and was the last person to see them alive. He was subjected to hours of interrogation without his parents or attorney present. The understandable anger about the death of the girls exploded when the word circulated that a black boy had been arrested for the murders. The sheriff claimed that George had confessed to the murders, though no written or signed statement was presented. George's father was summarily, summarily, George's father was summarily fired from his job. His family was told to leave town or else they would be lynched. Out of fear for their lives, George's family fled the town late that night, leaving George behind in jail with no family support. Within hours of announcing the alleged confession, a lynch mob formed at the jailhouse in Alkalu by the 14-year-old had already been moved to a jail in Charleston. A month later, a trial was convened. Facing charges of first-degree murder, George sat alone in front of an estimated crowd of 1,500 white people who had packed the courtroom and surrounded the building. No African Americans were allowed inside the courthouse. George's white, 
Georgia's wide court appointed attorney, a tax lawyer with political aspirations, called no witnesses. The prosecution's only evidence was a sheriff's testimony regarding Georgia's alleged confession. The trial was over in a few hours, an all-white jury deliberated for 10 minutes before convincing George, uh, before convicting George of rape and murder. Judge Stoll promptly sentenced the 14-year-old to death. George's lawyers said there would be no appeal because his family didn't have the money to pay for it. Despite the appeals from the NAACP and black clergy, uh, Despite the appeals from the NAACP and black clergy who asked the sentence to be converted to life imprisonment, Governor Olin Johnson refused to intervene and George was sent to Columbia to be executed in South Carolina's electric chair. Small even for his age, the five foot two, 90 pound, 92 pound Stinney walked up to the chair with a Bible in his hand. He had to sit on the book when prison staff couldn't fit the elect, uh, electrodes to his small frame. Alone in a room with no family or any people of color present, the terrified child sat in the oversized electric chair. He frantically searched the room for someone to help, but saw only law enforcement personnel and reporters. The adult-sized mask slid off George's face. When the first jolt of electricity struck his body, witnesses to the execution could see his wide open, tearful eye and saliva dripping from his mouth. 81 days after being approached by two girls, two young girls about where the flowers might be, George Stinney was pronounced dead. Years later, rumors surfed that a white man from a prominent family confessed to, confessed on his deathbed to killing the girls. Recently, an effort has been launched to exonerate George Stinney. The Stinney execution was horrific and heartbreaking, but it reflected the racial pol politics of the South more than the way children the Stinney execution was hor the Stinney execution was horrific and heartbreaking, but it reflected the polit the racial politics of the South more than the way children accused of crimes were generally treated. Hmm. It was an example of how policies and norms, once directed exclusively at controlling and punishing the black population have filtered their way into our general criminal justice system. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, the politics of fear and anger swept the country and fueling mass incarceration was turning its attention to children. Influential criminologists predicted a coming wave of super predators with whom the juvenile justice system would be unable to cope sometimes expressing uh, expressly sometimes expressly focusing on black and brown children theorists suggest that america would soon be overcome by elementary school youngsters who pack guns instead of lunches and who have absolutely no respect for human life panic over impeding or impending crime wave expected from these radically impulsive Brutally remorseful, uh, remorseless children led nearly every state to enact legislation that increased the exposure of children to adult, prison, uh, adult prosecution. Many states lowered or eliminated the minimum age for trying children as adults, leaving children as young as eight vulnerable to adult prosecution and imprisonment. Um, I am reading... Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, A Story of Justice and Redemption. This is Super Soul, Super Soul, and uh, which is a little spin-off 
from Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday. I've been watching it and I'm really intrigued by the authors and their presentation and you know their writing and, and their information and just how they you know the information that they have to share so I just recently just started buying their books and I'm been doing a lot more reading than I would normally have and um, you know it's very enlightening you know very you know you learn a lot being a retired police officer a lot of these stories here it resonates with me in a sense where you know I could see a lot of these things happening you know I even though I worked for as an officer but I you know I could still see a lot of these things happening in our judicial system so again the book is Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson it's a great read it'll keep you reading every page I'm gonna read it a second time take care bye bye